Azawajal describes there, we were talking that the, this is the narrative section of the surah where Allah recalls the account of Musa alayhi salam in brief words. Idhab ila fir'auna innahu tagha, go to the Pharaoh. Certainly he's the one, in fact, that has rebelled. Innahu tagha. A couple of language uh, issues here that I'd like to bring to your attention. The first of them is the meaning of the word tughyan that I didn't dive into as deeply yesterday. The word tagha, which is translated rebelled, uh, it occurs in the meaning, it gives the meanings of being oppressive, uh, and it, uh, and going too far in being oppressive, like outrageously oppressive. Like, you know how you get reports sometimes nowadays of people committing acts of torture or crimes against humanity and that kind of thing? That would actually come under the word tughyan in the modern sense or tagha. Uh, Al-utu wa dhulm Utu also means animosity And again, to, to do something that is an act of aggression To be, you know, there's one thing that somebody takes a military action Or takes violence and takes matters in their own hand Because they're defending themselves Or they're reacting to something that occurred It's another that when they, when they aggress Without any preemptive reason Or they're preemptive in their strike That's utu also And then on top of that Wa dhulm and oppression within So he's a, 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 an oppressive, dangerous entity, innahu tagha. The other thing that's important in the words innahu tagha is, uh, there's two, two ways of looking at it. The word inna in the Arabic language can serve sabab, grammati- gram- you know, grammatical analysis says. What that means is, go to the Pharaoh because he has rebelled. And so the reason Musa alayhi salam should go to the Pharaoh is because he's rebelled. That's powerful because what that means is that the, the, the work of Islam and the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have to go to the criminals. Like we have to go speak with them and engage with them. We can't just be talking about them. They have to be challenged, they have to be addressed, and they have to be given the message of Islam. We can't just sit in a corner, complain about what they do and their, you know, the crimes they commit, etc. They must be engaged directly. That would come because Allah is saying you have to go to him because he's a criminal, because he's rebelled. The other implication of innahu tagha, interestingly, is what they call al-ithbatu ala ghayr al-fa'il. What that means is, in fact, he is the one that's rebelled, not the other way around. In other words, he, when he does his criminal acts, when he punishes people, tortures people, kills people, etc., he makes it sound like they're the ones that are criminals. They're the ones that are rebelling against the government. They're the ones that have committed a crime. And Allah is saying, actually, it doesn't matter what he says, he's the one that's the criminal. And that's actually teaching us something very powerful about oppressive regimes. Oppressive regimes don't just commit acts of violence. They actually redefine what they do as peace, and what everybody else does as aggression and crimes. So you can have governments in the world, even today, of course, especially today, that are killing civilians. And when they're killing civilians, they're saying, no, 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 we are fighting the terrorists, or we're, we're fighting the outlaws, or we're fighting the anarchists, or we're fighting the, cor- the corrupt elements within our society, or the criminals. Or these are just a bunch of gangs, violent gangs, and we're getting rid of the criminals in society. And they'll come in their, you know, dressed up clothes and nice press releases and say, we are restoring peace and order while at the same time they're bombing hospitals. Or they're, they're burning down homes. You know, or shooting at children. And th- these kinds of things. So Allah by saying, innahu tagha is saying, doesn't matter what the propaganda is. He's the one that's the criminal. See through it. Because you know, it is in fact true that the greatest threat to the peace and harmony of Egypt was Fir'aun. I mean, the greatest threat to the people was Fir'aun. And yet, when Musa alayhi salam delivered his message, you know what he told people? He said, Yuridani an yukhrijakum bi ardikum bi sihrihima. That these Musa and Harun, their intention is to get you kicked out of your land. They're a danger to your country. <laughs> Fir'aun was saying, Musa is a danger. Musa is dangerous. He's the, he's the threat to your homeland security. You know? That he, he, he flipped the script. And so, innahu tagha actually teaches us that it doesn't matter what the script officially is. It doesn't matter what the press release is. You have to look at reality and Allah determines that he's in fact guilty of these crimes. And therefore, he should be spoken to. And then, فَقُلْ هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَن تَزَكَىٰ alluded to this yesterday that هَلْ لَكَ is soft language. But I also wanted to share some commentary here with you. Well, istifhamu huna lil 
مع تلطف وصرحه في قوله فقول له قولا لينا you know this question would you consider even the possibility of bettering yourself of coming towards a life that's more purified when Musa is supposed to speak to him in such soft language the commentary here is the question is here to suggest softness and courtesy and actually it's spelled out more openly in another part of the Quran in Surah Taha Allah Azza wa says both of you meaning Moses and Aaron Musa and Harun go to him and both of you should speak to him qawlan layyinan speak to him with soft sweet speech Layin is actually in Arabic the, de- the description of a really good date, not the haram kind between men and women, the date from a palm tree. That date, the sweet date. <laughs> you know, that's actually called layin, meaning speak to him softly. Speak to him in flexible language. Because you know, a date is soft and flexible and it's sweet. That's actually the description of the way you should speak to Fir'aun. This is actually also, this is also teaching us tactics. It's not just adab. It's not just manners that doesn't matter how obnoxious they are, you speak to them nicely, but this is actually strategic. When you are going to speak to people in political power, and you have a lot of anger built up inside you because, you know, you, you represent people who have been oppressed, and there are crimes that he's committed that he hasn't been charged with, and he hasn't taken, you know, the law, he's taken the law and order in his hands, etc. You've got all this built up, and now you finally get a chance to sit in this gathering and you get to meet this person who's responsible for all these crimes you don't just have your own anger you have the anger of all of your people built up inside you and you're the only one who gets to speak to him and that's the moment where you might throw a shoe at him and that's the moment that you might just scream and yell isn't it and guess what happens to the person who starts screaming and yelling what happens next within seconds they're removed from that audience aren't they they so they got to, what did that sh- shoe throwing accomplish other than a, you know a funny scene on for comedians but other than that what did it accomplish you got to blow your hot air but you got you accomplished nothing you should have come across as calm and cool you have an agenda you're not there to suck up to anybody you're not there to you know kiss his feet or nothing but the manner in which you speak has to be soft collected calm so that you don't come across as a you know, erratic, angry maniac, and they say, well, this person's not behaving, remove him from here. As a matter of fact, when you remain calm and you speak, over time, pretty, pretty soon, because you're remaining and keeping your composure, the oppressor will lose his cool. And they'll start looking like a fool. Because you kept your cool. And that's a very important lesson to learn, because Musa salam, when he's going to go to Fir'aun, he's got a lot of aggression built up inside of him, he's seen a lot of the oppression first hand. And as a matter of fact, the, you know, his own mother, his own family. And on top of that, Asiya, who, who's begging, who's begging Allah for protection from, from Fir'aun. He's seen that in the household. He's oppressive inside the home and for the entire land. And for someone like Musa alayhi salam who gets angry easily, this is also important. Musa alayhi salam has a pretty serious temper. And he could throw a punch. We've seen that before. And he could, he just takes matters in his hands. And he, he, he's afraid of his temper. As a matter of fact, when he spoke to Allah, he said, وَيَضِيقُ صَدْرِي وَلَا يَنْطَلِقُ لِسَانِي My chest becomes tight. Because if he says obnoxious things like, I am God, how dare you speak to me this way? It's gonna make me upset. My chest is gonna become tight. And when it does, my, my tongue stops moving, which is another way of saying my tongues don't do the talking at that point, my hands do. That's also part of the meaning. So Ya Allah, I get really upset. So you need to send me, give me someone who will make sure I remain calm and contain. فَأَرْسِلْ إِلَىٰ Harun. Give me Harun. Send Harun along too. Right? So that's, that's part of the strategy of Musa alayhi salam. What we're trying to understand here then is people who represent the cause of Islam in the media. People are going to, who are going to get a chance to speak with power. They have to be people who can control themselves. They have to be people that can remain calm and they can remain on point and they can't be swayed by emotion because those people are master manipulators. Fir'aun is a master manipulator. He will get you upset, he will get you riled up, you know. He will, he will make comments that will make you go, how dare you speak that after all the crimes you've committed? And he's trying to get under your skin so you lose it and then you look like the lunatic. You look like the, you know, the absurd one. And so Innahu Taha has a lot 
of you know, and, and on top of that, فَقُلْ هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَنْ تَزَكَّى has a lot of strategy inside of it. So in any case, فَقُلْ هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَنْ تَزَكَّى نَا وَأَهْدِيَكَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ فَتَخْشَى and so I'm, I'm, that I may guide you, to you towards your master so you may be afraid. But before we get to that, the, the idea of tazakka, to become pure. وَالزَّكَاةُ أَنْنُمُوا عَنْ خَيْرٍ وَبَرَكَةٍ وَتَزْكِيَةُ النَّفْسِ أَنْ تَتَطَهَّرْ وَتَنْمُوَ فَضَائِلُهَا وَتَنْمُوَ فَضَائِلُهَا So the idea of zakat in Arabic is that something grows or betters because of goodness. In other words, we're learning something about the notion of becoming a better person. Becoming a better person means that you and I are trying to get away from things that are filthy. And as we do, it enhances us. And as it enhances us, Allah it adds barakah in your life and goodness in your life. What that means is Allah opens more doors for you to do more good and more strength for you to get away from the bad stuff in your life. And that cycle keeps on strengthening you to get further and further away. Nobody turns into an angel overnight. Nobody becomes perfect overnight. Nobody starts praying five times a day in the masjid, etc., etc., overnight. Then that doesn't happen. You take steps. You go one step after another, one stage after another, right? So the idea of ila and tazakka is you're, okay, fine, you're not gonna be, you're not gonna be a salih tomorrow, but at least you're on the road. At least that, and that's what's expected of you. I was really interested in, um, and I thought I knew this word, but I, I really didn't. Uh, the word huda, one of the most common words in the Quran, guidance, right? And it's, it's, you know, orig, its origin. Aslu isti'malihi fil huda as-sakhra adnati'a fil ma'i yu'minu biha al-athar. The origin of the word huda is actually, which we call guidance, is actually a rock protruding from the water. Like, uh, you know, you're out at sea, or you're close to, you're, you're not sure where you are, and there's a boulder or a pretty tiny island, like a rock sticking out of the water, and that becomes a landmark or a sea mark, if you will. Right, so now, the, those who are discovering, or they were told, go this way, and you might discover a rock, and that's when you know you're close to the island, or whatever. So they look at that, and they know that they're on the right track. And from it comes the word huda. That's the original meaning of it. Wal huda wajhun nahar fihi tariq And huda is our... Original Arabic uses the word huda also for bright, the bright daytime in which the road is absolutely clear because you know at nighttime the desert is impossible to navigate and that the opposite is going to come later on with the word ghatash you know aghtasha laylaha ghatash in Arabic at nighttime it's covered you can't really tell where to go la yuhtada bihi you can't possibly find your directions in the time of ghatash but anyway wa ahdiyaka ila rabbika suggesting that i will guide you towards your master in other words i will tell you what landmarks you're supposed to what milestones you're supposed to reach and so on that note i wanted to you know based on the kinds of questions people ask me not just stuff i read in books but the kinds of discussions i have with people i wanted to share some things with you maybe you've had the question yourself how do i know if i'm guided how do i know if allah is happy with me I mean, I'm trying to do this, 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 and this, but I'm not sure if this is good enough or, you know, whether Allah will accept it or not. And people have these kinds of notions, right? And then people ask, how do I know if my intentions are pure? And how do I know if my heart is clean? And I'm trying to do this dhikr and that dua, and which dua can I make that I can become X, Y, Z? And so there's all this like mystery as to where do I stand with Allah? So the, the first thing I'd like to share with you about that is that, you know, the rock sticking out of the water is a pretty prominent milestone. It's not a mysterious thing. It's a pretty obvious milestone, right? Guidance is not some crazy mystical thing until you see a parrot in your dream. You don't know if you're guided or not. <laughs> There's nothing crazy about guidance. Guidance is straightforward and simple. It's straightforward and simple. The first milestone in guidance is you are away from major evils. First milestone. You're doing good. Like, you know, sometimes moms bring their sons to me. It's, it's my favorite thing to, you know, see moms humiliate their, their teenage sons by bringing them to Nomar Ali Khan and saying, Dr. Mahal, but he's good. He prays, but he wakes a little, he, I have to wake him up for Fajr. I was like, auntie, you have to wake him up for Fajr? Really? Yeah, he doesn't wake up on his own. Hmm, that's horrible. This kid is just going straight to hell. No, he's not. There <laughs> are kids. There are kids who you could wake them up for Fajr and they'll hit you back. Your kid actually gets up and prays. One mother complained to me that he goes to the masjid but he's never there before the adhan. 
What planet are you living on? What planet are you living on? Compare this to the vast majority of kids his age. What he's doing, you should give him an award every morning. Make him his favorite breakfast every morning. For God's sake, he's going to the masjid. That's huge. She came to me to complain about him. I patted him on the back. I said, good job, man. Keep it up. That's awesome. You, I, told, I told off his mom, you should be proud. And he's like, <laughs> you know, he's like, <laughs> you know. We have these superficially high standards of what it means to be guided. For a young man to, to do that, to fight his sleep and you know, pray, to, not, to stay out of bad company. One came to me and said, he's 18 years old, he doesn't hang out with girls, he doesn't do drugs, he doesn't drink, he prays five times a day. It's just that sometimes he plays video games. And I said, auntie, let him play more video games. Because the stuff he's not doing is amazing. The stuff he would have been doing otherwise, or he really loves basketball, or he really, he spends a lot of time playing with his friends. I was like, does he, when he goes on the weekend to play with his friends, does he pray? Yeah. So let him play. What's wrong with that? That's not, yeah, some kid's really happy right now. Yeah, good. <laughs> then, then people come to me with, especially with kids, right? They'll, I, uh, Ustaz, I really want your advice on parenting. Uh, okay, sure. Yeah. How old is your child? Six months. Let him be a baby. I really need your advice on how to teach my child Qur'an. He's two years old. Chill out. He's two years old. Let him be a baby. You don't need to turn him into a hafiz of Qur'an at three years old. You don't, chill out. Relax. Why do you have to force these standards on them? Who created these standards anyway? And now what's unfortunately happened in terms of guidance is we... The, um, the majority of the ummah have the completely false standards of guidance. Completely false. If my child has memorized the Qur'an, he's guided. Or she's guided. If my child knows how to recite the Qur'an or finish reciting the Qur'an, they're guided. What? There are plenty of kids that have memorized the entire Qur'an and they are now in gangs. I know plenty of them in different cities in this country that I can name that are in jail. That are hufad of Qur'an. They're, they're in jail that dealt drugs. Why am I saying that to you? Because our deen did not say, once you memorize Allah's book, you'll be guided. Or once you recite beautifully, you'll be guided. Or once you dress a certain way, you'll be guided. It didn't say these things. Once you come to Sunday school, you'll be guided. Or when you go to Islamic school, you'll be guided. Guidance is actually some very fundamental milestones. The way you think, the way you prioritize life, you're the way you treat people. Our guidance fundamentally is first and foremost attitude and some fundamental behavior. That's it. That's guidance. Knowledge, worship, all of those things, they enhance guidance. They further guidance. They support guidance. But we have removed from the equation our attitudes, our thought process, our behavior, our mannerisms. They don't have to do with guidance. It's just recitation and worship and appearance. That's guidance. That's all artificial. That's not guidance at all. So this is, that, that road needs to be reestablished. And that road is not just in reciting the Qur'an. It's actually in restoring the thought process that the Qur'an inspired. It wanted people to think a certain way. You know, to, to live their lives a certain way. Any case, so وَأَهْدِيَكَ إِلَى رَبِّكَ The road to guidance is a very simple one. On the, on the side note, this might, some of you might think this is very controversial. I have to share with you what I'm convinced of, uh, not anything else. You are completely free to disagree. Uh, we, we're all students here, so am I, and I may be entirely wrong. But let me just tell you, our, when you study the Qur'an, beginning to end, and you study the life of our Messenger وسلم, beginning to end. And the advice that he used to give people when they would come to him and say, I want to be a better person, I want to go to Jannah, what should I do? The advice that he would give would be very simple. It's never complicated. It's never complicated. It's always simple. And it's not like, here are the 80 things you do to purify your heart. Or here are the 70, here's the manual of checking whether or not your heart is cleaner. No, it was nothing like that. It was just straightforward. Uh, how about afshu salam wa at'imu ta'am? How about you just say salam to people and feed people? Be more hospitable. Cool. That's what I gotta do? Yeah, yeah, just, just do that. Qul la ilaha illallah thumma Just say la ilaha illallah and be firm. 
Another one comes and he says, لا تغضب, don't be angry. Just don't, you have a temper issue, don't be so mad. Work on your temper. That's it, done. What about Qiyam layl What about fasting on Mondays and Thursdays? What about that? He didn't give the whole list. We make the whole list based on multiple hadith, on multiple occasions. But do you ever wonder why the Prophet ﷺ didn't, one person came and sat him down and gave him the entire list, all in one shot? He didn't. Why not? Because the deen is simple. It doesn't ask much of you. It doesn't put a lot of burdens on you. But now we, because we, we want to mystify the subject, we want to have a manual of purification, which is exhaustive. And here are the 400 things that you must purify your tongue from. And here are the 500 things to cleanse your heart. And here's what you do with your eyes. And here's what you do with your limbs. And you're just like, Islam is, oof, that's intense. And when you read more and more of that stuff, you realize I'll never be that.